and putting it on the, on the open market for bidding to the highest bidder. I want to close my, my remarks tonight um, by actually reading something to you that I think every American should be required to read. There's been a long fight for accountability for some of the crimes that were committed in these wars by officials. Authorization of torture, authoriz authorization of tactics that went outside of the Army Field Manual's uh, guidelines for the treatment of prisoners, uh, the horrific sights that we've seen at some of the secret prisons that were being run. At, run. And there have been attempts by victims of extraordinary rendition, the, the government-sanctioned kidnapping and torture program uh, that was prevalent throughout both the Clinton and the uh, Bush administrations. Uh, and, and some of the people that have been victims of this and were caught up in something that they were not a participant in, they weren't fighters, and they were taken, and they were tortured for no good reason whatsoever. And I know, I know former interrogators uh, and former intelligence people who have spoken out in the strongest terms about the torture that was meted out against some of the prisoners that the U.S. was holding. And a lot of people on the left try to make this sound like it's just, it, was, it happened under the Bush administration and it stopped under the Obama administration. Read the Associated Press today. There's a story about a network of secret prisons being run right now in Afghanistan. But when these people try to fight for their accountability, for accountability, one of the things that happened is that um, former families of former prisoners at Guantanamo, uh, who believe that their loved ones were beaten to death in Guantanamo, is a, it's a it's a case that you can look into, but we don't have time to discuss in detail right now. Filed a lawsuit against Secretary of Defense, then former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, the former Chair of the Joint Chiefs uh, Richard Myers and 22 other military officials that were involved with the chain of command at Guantanamo. And what they were alleging was that their loved ones were effectively tortured to death at Guantanamo. And the case was gaining steam, and it was heading toward a trial. And it would have been unprecedented, because Secretary Rumsfeld and former chairman, uh, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs were being sued in their individual capacity. So there would have been personal responsibility for what they did, as, what they authorized as public officials. When this case came in front of the court, President Obama had already been elected and was in, was in office. And he instructed Attorney General Eric Holder to intervene in that case on behalf of Donald Rumsfeld and, and the other defendants in that case. And they used uh, a, a, a little known act that was passed in the 1980s called the Westfall Act. And the Westfall Act, in short, was passed to protect federal workers from individual liability for torts or crimes or wrongs committed during the course of their official duties. If a postal worker is driving a truck and, uh, and, and the wheel pops off the truck and they veer onto a sidewalk and they kill people on that sidewalk, that individual postal worker cannot be sued or prosecuted as a criminal for having not maintained that vehicle properly. It would be the responsibility of the government. And if there was a lawsuit against them, the government would step in and say, we're going to certify this individual as, as a Westfall defendant, meaning that we take them out of the case and the United States government becomes the responsible party for this. And the United States government has sovereign immunity, so those cases are thrown out of court. It really, it really means that if you're, if, if you're killed during the official course of duty of some official, they can't be prosecuted and you're never going to get justice because the U.S. says you can't, you can't do anything about it. So, so this was not intended to be used in war. This was, a, this was about minor things that happened. The, the, Barney Frank, the member of Congress who authored this legislation, has said repeatedly over the years that it, it's been misused by Bush and Obama to do things it was not intended to do. But the point is, they intervened in this case where heinous things were alleged against Rumsfeld, Myers, and others, torture, et cetera, authorizing torture, et cetera. And so when, when the Obama administration intervened, the Assistant Attorney General, Tony West, wrote a brief saying that Rumsfeld and the others should be relieved of responsibility for this. And in doing so, he cited the Westfall Act, and then he wrote, and this is a direct quote, this is, this is under the Obama administration's Justice Department, the type of activities alleged against the individual defendants were foreseeable and were a direct outgrowth of their responsibility to detain and gather intelligence from suspected enemy combatants. He cited case law saying that genocide, torture, forced relocation, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment by individual defendants employed by the Department of Defense and State Department were within the scope of their employment. I want to read that part again because I, I, I truly believe every campus in this country should require its students to read the position of the United States government on cases of torture and, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. 
This is the Obama administration's Justice Department position on, on allegations of torture. Not saying they're true or false, they're assuming that they're true for the purpose of this. Genocide, torture, forced relocation, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment by individual defendants employed by the Department of Defense and State Department were within the scope of their employment. That is a shocking statement. Because what it says is if you torture someone, if you participate in genocide or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment of someone, and you were working for the State Department or the Defense Department, it was in the official scope of your employment. Since when did genocide or torture become a part of the official scope of employment of the Department of Defense or the State Department? If this had happened under the Bush administration, I think a lot of people would have said, oh, that's, that's just Bush. This is under the Obama administration. They are co-signing those policies by continuing to defend them. I wasn't at Guantanamo. I have no idea what happened to those prisoners. But I do know what the Obama administration's position on it is if they were tortured to death. And that's shocking to me. It's shocking that, that, that we live in a country where a man who <coughs> campaigned on this promise to change so much could co-sign so many of these atrocious policies that I've just been talking about tonight. If there's one lesson we should get from examining the foreign policy, in particular of the Obama administration, it's, it's a desperate call for people to not act in a partisan way, to preserve your intellectual integrity and your intellectual honesty, to never cede your conscience to a politician or, or someone that's campaigning for your votes, to, to always think first of what your heart says is right before you buy into someone's rhetoric. For young people in this country, for those of you that are here in school, you have an incredible chance to actually, to actually change the way things are. And where it starts is by never allowing someone else to dictate your conscience for you and what it tells you. And that's my challenge for those of you that are students and also to those of us that are out in the other part of the world. So thank you very much for your time tonight. I really <laughs>
Well, the first, just for those of you who might, might not have been able to hear him, um, the, the first part of the question was asking about the role of, uh, of contractors within the covert war that's being waged inside of Pakistan that involves at various times the ISI, CIA, and, uh, and others. Um, and then the second part was uh, asking me what I think of drone strikes and if they've been effective or what they've been uh, intended to do. I don't know how many of you followed this case, but there, but there was um, a, an individual that, had, that was reported in the press to be a U.S. diplomat that was arrested in Pakistan named Raymond Davis. Um, and he was arrested uh, a few months ago after he shot and killed uh, two Pakistanis in, uh, in the city of Lahore. And um, what we now know about Raymond Davis is that he was either uh, a member of an operative of the Central Intelligence Agency in Pakistan, or he was um, a member of the Joint Special Operations Command working on what's called the Special Missions Unit, which is a highly classified uh, unit that would be engaged in either a targeted capture or killing operation um, in that country. And it's possible in either of those cases that what Raymond Davis um, was doing was targeting members of a terrorist organization called lashkar e taiba which was behind the Mumbai bombings um, a, a few years ago and was recently designated by the United States as a, uh, as a foreign terrorist organization. Um, we probably will never know what Raymond Davis was doing. He claims that he shot these two individuals in self-defense. Uh, it's quite possible, if not likely, that the two people he shot were ISI agents, Pakistan spy agents, that were trailing him. Um, but what that case brought to light, and this, he was just recently released as uh, part of a deal that the United States government cut with the Pakistanis to pay them uh, an undisclosed amount of money, but some say it's a few hundred thousand dollars per family. And then there was a third individual that was run over by the backup car that Raymond Davis's team had there. Um, and he, so he was smuggled out of Pakistan into Afghanistan, and now, my understanding, is back in the United States. But what this brought to light is the fact that the United States is engaged in a war in Pakistan and has been for quite some time. The, the role of private contractors also goes into <coughs> your question about drone strikes. Blackwater, for instance, one of the things it was doing in Pakistan was, uh, was helping to plot out uh, drone strikes against what, what the U.S. determined to be high-value targets inside of Pakistan and also in, in other countries in the, in the region. And they were also a, uh, actually loading uh, missiles onto the, uh, onto the drones. Um, contractors are involved with every aspect of the waging of wars today, and that's no different in Pakistan. Um, where, where it's become a big story in Pakistan is because there, there have been a number of unresolved killings and bombings that have happened that the Taliban, uh, the Tahriki Taliban, the Taliban in uh, Pakistan, have blamed on Blackwater. And so it's become a very big story in Pakistan. And there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of exaggeration, and I, I've dealt with Pakistani journalists trying to get them to calm down and some of the things that they're reporting because it's not true. Having said that, they have immunity, the contractors do, in Pakistan. And in a way, and, and hundreds of them are potentially classified as either diplomats or, or even more disturbing as aid workers. Um, and they're working in a, in a covert nature. And if you classify, if you classify a, um, a, an armed operator who's going to be doing targeted killings as an aid worker, you are putting actual aid workers in very serious danger. As for the broader issue of the drone strikes, I thought it was interesting that um, the senior figures recently within the ISI um, and the Pakistani military both came out in favor of the drone strikes, which was unusual because Pakistan's policy usually is that it doesn't discuss the drone strikes. There's no question that a tremendous number of innocent people have been killed in those drone strikes. Um, and, you know, very sophisticated military planners who work for General Petraeus and others have publicly come out against the policy of the drone strikes, like David Kilcullen, um, who's a very respected figure within the military planning world, uh, wrote a very public op-ed in the New York Times um, about the, uh, the calculus of the drone strikes, meaning that the, the United States is perhaps giving more motivation for terrorism than they are fighting actual terrorists by engaging in drone strikes that kill um, innocent civilians. Uh, I, would, I would actually argue that even if you're killing people that are actual terrorists, people you categorize under legal definitions as terrorists, um, the blowback from those incidents, if innocent people are killed, uh, causes far more damage than that individual terrorist probably could have caused. In, in many, many cases, 
I, I would say that that's true. And I'm not saying that off the, off the cuff. I'm saying it from years of analyzing it. I, I think that we are giving new generations of people in Pakistan a, an actual motive to want to join some kind of fight against the Pakistani government or against the, the United States. So I, I think strategically it is, I, I think you can make a very solid argument that it is very poor strategy. Um, morally, I think it is, is really a sort of shocking evolution in war where you have people that can sit at Creech Air Force Base in the southwest of the United States and pilot, people say they're unmanned or unpiloted. They're actually piloted oftentimes by Air Force pilots who are trained in operating them and they don't even have to be in the theater of war where they're being operated. I, I have a friend who actually just finished a contract as a drone pilot in, at Creech Air Force Base. Um, and he told me one day that uh, every day he would drive off the base, there's a sign on it that's on the base that says, uh, buckle up, this is the most dangerous part of your day, meaning getting, getting on the highway. But he, he was targeting people from, from you know, Nevada who were in Pakistan. So I mean, that, this, this, this means that war can, becomes more of a video game because you don't actually have to, you don't have to be pulling the trigger uh, in, in, front of any, in front of anyone. You're not firing actual munitions on the ground. You're not seeing it. You're, you're, it's like you're playing Xbox, Call of Duty or something. And it's, I, I, I think psychologists will have a field day analyzing what goes on in the minds of the young pilots that are, are doing those operations half a world away. Are you aware of any um, intensification or particular examples of targeting or persecution of Yemeni Americans living in the United States in recent years? Well, I mean, yeah, there's, in this area, the Lackawanna Six, um, you know, were, <clears throat> were six Yemeni Americans that were prosecuted for provide, under the charge of providing material support for terrorism. Um, and in fact, there was a whole book written about that case by a reporter for National Public Radio. Um, and, you know, it, 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 there's a pattern that's really disturbing that's, that's developing where the FBI seems to become very effective at breaking up its own terror plots, where they're working with, they go in and they infiltrate Muslim communities and they find usually someone who's mentally unstable um, and, and kind of target them and end up being the ones really encouraging them to take, to, to take some kind of an action that then the FBI breaks up. Um, and I, I, think, I think we have some serious problems with entrapment that are going on um, in the United States. But I'm not aware of any recent um, cases involving Yemeni Americans. Um, there are always cases of Arab Americans that are being targeted um, or arrested or charged with crimes. And I think there's a lot of cases where they've done absolutely nothing wrong. Um, and I think we operate on a very dangerous 1% doctrine where, you know, if there's 1% chance that person is a terrorist, well, we should take them down. And that actually goes, flies in the face of, of the Constitution. And I think there's a real serious problem with that. And, and, and racial profiling is a part of it. So. We'll keep alternating, so go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my question was that, what do you think the larger issue is? It, is it a matter of our um, government who is currently funding these private um, contractors under the Obama administration, or is it the actual power that is being gained through these private sectors themselves now who have the ability to be hired by these other countries? Right. So what do you believe the larger issue is, and what exactly should we be doing? I mean, I, I think, you know, I could talk until I'm blue in the face about all the stuff that Blackwater has done or any of these other companies, but um, they wouldn't exist if there wasn't a thirst for their services. Um, and so, you know, the primary responsibility for the proliferation of these companies actually resides with Congress and the President for the most part, and to an extent, the Defense Department bureaucracy. Um, the, the, the fact is that without those private forces right now, the United States would not be able to be in Afghanistan and Iraq and conducting the no-fly zone operations in Libya at the same time. We, we are entirely addicted to using private forces. So it, you know, it, it would require President Obama to uh, take an entirely different approach to the way that the US is waging its wars. It flies in the face of the past 20 years of trend. Um, I think that, uh, that Congress has failed miserably to enact any effective laws that oversee or limit the, the, the power of these companies. Um, and I think the, the United Nations has a working group on the use of mercenaries that is toothless, that has no actual power to do anything, 
that has done a very effective job of stating the problem around the world. Um, the, it's, it's an almost unregulated industry. And, and, and we see with, with the bank scandal that happened, what happens when you, when you don't have effective regulation or laws of oversight. And in this case, we're talking about life and death and war zones. So um, I think these, these companies are, are there because the demand for their services is there and they're exploiting it. And, and to go back, I often go back and reread President Eisenhower's farewell address where he talked about the rise of the military industrial complex. And people like to quote that, but I think a lot of people who quote that haven't actually read the speech. Because what, what, what Eisenhower was talking about was the danger, the danger of having manufacturers of the weapons of war being involved with the electoral process in the United States and actually building in a motive for war and not peace. And, and, and so you, have, you give members of Congress a motivation to take far more belligerent positions because it's going to benefit their campaigns because the weapons industry is going to pour money into it. Uh, and that, that also is happening to an extent with the private security companies and private intelligence companies. They are, they are calling the shots with some members of Congress by donating to their campaigns. So at the end of the day, I think, I, I think the most effective thing we could do is to uh, change the way that campaigns are financed in the United States. The, the recent Supreme Court decision that, that made corporations a person, I mean, that, 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 is, that is an outrageous decision. Um, and I mean, if, they, if, they, if they're people, then they should be given, they should also be subjected to the corporate death penalty uh, as, as America. As people. Well, you've done some work on uh, black water. Can, can you talk a little bit closer to the, uh, yeah, there you go. You've done some work on uh, black water in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, I forgot to talk, yes, yeah. Oh, you want me to talk about that? Oh, yeah, and I forgot, I forgot, you're from, I forgot to talk about this. Well, this is actually a crazy story. This is one of the reasons why I sort of became obsessed with Blackwater. Um, I, I was telling John, uh, my bodyguard over there before, that we were talking about how I, uh, how I got involved with, uh, with this story. And I had spent a lot of time in Fallujah, Iraq. And when the four Blackwater men got uh, ambushed and killed there in a, in, in a shockingly brutal way uh, and strung up from a bridge in Fallujah uh, on March 31st, 2004, um, I got to know the families of those four men very well, and, and the mo particularly the mothers of two of the men. Um, Katie Halvinston, whose son Scott was a, a Navy SEAL. He'd only been in Iraq for uh, 48 hours when he got ambushed, and, and his torso, charred torso, was strung up from a bridge. Um, and then uh, Jerry Zopko was a former Army Ranger uh, who was a very serious combat veteran um, and had, had been working for a number of private military companies since 9-11. I got to know those two moms very well. And, and the short story of them is that they wanted answers from Blackwater about what happened and how their loved ones ended up in this incredibly dangerous city of Fallujah with no body armor, no, in, in what are called soft skin vehicles. They weren't in armored vehicles. They, they went into the center of a city in, in unarmored SUVs, short two men and, and without a saw, uh, without, without, a he without heavy weapons, um, in an area that US forces wouldn't go into with tanks at the time. And they end up getting killed. So the mothers of these guys did what you know, uh, I think a lot of mothers have to do on a daily basis when their sons or daughters are killed in a war zone. They want to know how it happened. And so they start asking questions. And if you're in the military, there's an official process to do that. But if you work for a private company, it's not so clear. And when they started to ask those questions, they were treat treated in an incredibly horrible way by the company. In fact, it got so tense that at one point a Blackwater executive shouted at the mother of one of those guys, if you want to know, you have to sue us. And it was because Blackwater was trying to cover up the fact that it was a shoddy mission. They sent these guys on, on, a, on a mission they shouldn't have been on without, without adequate personnel, armor, or weapons. And they didn't want to be responsible for it, and so they treated those families like dirt. And, and long story short about that is that when those mothers sued to try to get the answers, Blackwater countersued the mothers for $10 million. So that, that, was, that was the first part of how I got involved with this story. The second was, I go down to New Orleans right after the flooding of the city began, um, after Hurricane Katrina hit. And, um, and I was... Uh, I was standing on a street corner in the French Quarter uh, talking to a couple of New York City police officers that had come down to, uh, to volunteer. One of, the, one of the amazing things that happened when the federal government ignored what was going on there for weeks, uh, but, but policemen and firefighters from all over the country came down to New Orleans. So I, I'm from New York, I'm from Brooklyn, I saw some guys from a precinct in Brooklyn, I went up to them, I started talking to them. We're hanging out in this corner. And this car speeds up, it was a compact car, it was a small car, speeds up next to us and these four just massive guys get out of the car with wraparound sunglasses, M4 uh, assault rifles, Glock 9 strapped to their leg. Um, and uh, 
and they come up to us and they say to the police officers, where, where are the Blackwater guys based? And, um, and my head kind of just went, burr, burr, burr. like I was in Blackwater. I was, I'm in New Orleans, it's just crazy. Like it's, you know, there's the, all you saw was like weird militia type dudes driving around and guns in the back of a truck. I mean, there's, there's no one there. There was no FEMA, there was no National Guard because the National Guard was deployed in Iraq. There was no one there. And so I saw these guys get out and ask where the Blackwater guys are and the, the New York, New Orleans police officers say, something to them that I didn't hear because I was kind of like in la-la land about it. They get back into their little car and they, they speed away. I had no license plates on the car. They speed back on the street. And I said to the police officers, Black, Blackwater? You mean like the guys in Iraq and, and Afghanistan? And I hadn't done any reporting on Blackwater before this. I had only looked into the Fallujah incident, but I hadn't done any reporting on it. I was down there to just cover the, the disaster. Um, and they said, oh yeah, they're all, they're all over the place. And I was like, well, Blackwater? I did, yeah, yeah. And I was like, well, where, where can I want to talk to him? Where can I go find him? He's like, you can go either way on the street, meaning like they're just everywhere. So sure enough, I walk two blocks down and I see these Blackwater guys um, throwing a mattress out of a, uh, an apartment, a second floor apartment um, on, on, uh, on Bourbon and St. James. And they, they're throwing the mattress there and they drape an American flag over this balcony. And they were sort of standing there on point, um, not particularly doing anything, just kind of hanging out. And so I went up and started talking to them. And, uh, you know, we were talking about Iraq because I had been in Iraq and I was asking them what they did. And one guy was, he was like, oh, I was part of the security detail for John Negroponte, who at the time was the U.S. ambassador there. And, um, you know, another guy was talking about his time in Afghanistan. And we were just kind of making small talk. And then I said, you know, so who are you guys working for down here? And, uh, and then they all kind of started going, eh, you know not wanting to talk about it. I hear one guy on his phone saying, you don't want to work for Blackwater down here, you know, go with one of the other companies because they're only, Blackwater's only paying 350 a day plus a per diem. And uh, you know, the other guy's like, you know, we got 650 in Iraq and you know, they're kind of complaining. And fi so finally I said, well, what's your mission down here? And then one guy said to me, we're here to confront criminals and stop looters. Uh, and I said, oh, under, under whose authority? Um, he said, Blackwater's. And I said, well, I mean, Blackwater's not an, an agency of the federal government. He's like, God, oh, don't get smart with me. And I was like, no, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like, who, under whose legal authority are you guys operating? I'm just asking, like, what your what your orders are. Um, and finally, this guy clearly thinks I'm a smart ass, and he pulls out a, a gold badge. He whips a badge out at me, and he says, um, I was deputized by the governor of the state of Louisiana. That's who. And he said, we have authority to use lethal force if we deem it necessary. And uh, so, you know, I have this conversation with them, and now they're, you know, they have power to detain, use lethal force, all this stuff. So I start looking into it. Department of Homeland Security denies that Blackwater has been hired. Uh, the State Department denies that Blackwater has been hired. Governor of Louisiana denies that she's deputized anyone. Um, so it, it sort of became an issue. This was in early September 2005. So it turns out that what happened was that. Eric Prince, the owner of Blackwater, decided on August 28, 2005, to send 184 of his men into New Orleans to stop looters. A private U.S. citizen sends in men armed with M4 assault rifles, Puma helicopter, Glock 9s, onto the streets of a U.S. city with no permission from any entity of the United States government or the Louisiana government. And, and they're posing as law enforcement, and they're saying that they're there to confront criminals and stop looters. And these, some of these guys were, were tier one, tier two operators. They were 82nd Airborne or SEALs. And they're on the streets of, they could do serious, serious damage if they wanted to. I mean, these are sophisticated guys. And they're all of a sudden on the streets of a, of a US city. Well, it turns out that they were there for a week working for private banks, working for wealthy individuals, guarding gated communities, operating checkpoints. And after they were there for eight days, being there, you know, they always say is 90% of life. On the eighth day, they were actually hired by the Bush administration because they were there and because the National Guard wasn't there, because the National Guard was deployed in Iraq. And so the Blackwater guys were hired on a $73 million no-bid contract for three months to operate in New Orleans as the official bodyguard force for FEMA. I'm not sure that FEMA has arrived yet in New Orleans, but they had a security <laughs> force on a no-bid contract. And Blackwater made well over $100 million in its operations there in New Orleans, and then it swelled to 600 guys, and they were operating in Texas and elsewhere, and then they set up their own um, camp down there. So they, they, made a, they made a tremendous amount of money, and, um, and it's not exactly clear what they did. It hasn't been thoroughly investigated.